Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Let's Dev, where today we're recreating yet another old classic, Minesweeper. That's right, today we'll be taking a shot at recreating Minesweeper using some things we've learned in recent episodes. Included features will be board generation, bomb placement, tile manipulation, and interactables similar to those found in most games of Minesweeper. All done in as few objects as possible. And yes, we'll just be focusing on recreating basic Minesweeper, nothing more, nothing less, just a good old fashioned clone. Sounds like a plan, so let's not waste any more time and get to the coding. First up was generating the board. For now, we'll be sticking with a static 4x4 grid. Then in the drive-in, the grid would be, well, drawn out using 16x16 sprites. One day I'll learn to use tiles, one day. Anyway, a cursor was also drawn. And that's all we'd need for now for the front end of our clone, so let's get to the back end. A DS grid was created with a size matching our width and height variables, which again for now are just static fours. The grid was then filled with various bits of data packed into a nested array. And just to test that this was in fact working, the first entry in the nested array was then drawn to the visual grid. Looking good so far. So back to the code, we'd need variables to keep track of the mouse's position. And using some math, those variables would track the mouse's position to the nearest tile. The tracking was then clamped to just within the board's dimensions to prevent errors from occurring. Then to fully test that the math was working, the board had its width and height randomized. Thankfully this worked, though I do question the validity of the math. Regardless, it seemed that all was well, so it was time to move on. Next up was figuring out how to alter the values within our nested arrays. Thankfully, after a bit of research, the answer was as simple as using GameMaker's Array Accessor. And just like that, we were now able to alter values within the nested arrays stored in our data grid. The values being displayed here representing whether or not a tile has been revealed. So with that working, it was time to draw a spiffy little mine ready to be swept in our Minesweeper clone. For the sake of simplicity, this next bit of code was moved to another object specifically for mine. The mine controller object would choose four random grid spaces. Those spaces would then be marked with mines if not already marked. This process continues until enough mines have been placed. Then in the main controller, mines are drawn in all marked spaces. And there we had it, mines in our Minesweeper clone. And next up was the tough part, counting the mines. So going back to the mine controller, when mines are placed, a few other values would also be changed. To summarize, when a mine is placed, all surrounding tiles have their counter value increased by 1. So theoretically, anytime a tile is affected by a mine being placed, that value should slowly increase, which in turn should give us similar numbers that we'd see in a game of Minesweeper. And it almost worked perfectly. I didn't realize it at the time, but for some of the tiles, often near the edges of the board, weren't counting correctly. But I moved on thinking everything was working. So to put a kibosh on the whole numbers thing, any tiles with zero size touching mines were hidden. And finally, covers to hide all that data were drawn. Nice. You know what, quick glance, this actually looks like not broken. So next up was checking for those zero marked tiles. Much like in Minesweeper, when zero tiles are revealed, they will also reveal any nearby tiles that aren't bombs. This would cause that same cascading reveal effect seen in regular Minesweeper. At this point, I was almost out of time, so I haphazardly tried to code in win and loss conditions. Obviously, if a player clicks on a tile that is marked with a mine, then the game is over. But if all mines were left intact, the player wins. Unfortunately, the win condition was coded wrong, and I wasn't able to fix it in time. But regardless, the loss condition worked, and really, that's all that mattered. It was also here that I finally realized my numbers weren't all that accurate, though I can't imagine a fix for that issue would be too difficult to figure out. Anyway, the personal goal here was to recreate Minesweeper in just one object, and technically that was accomplished, since the only reason I broke up mine placement into its own object was for simplicity's sake. All in all, discovering nested arrays worked in GameMaker has legitimately opened up so much new potential, and I think this just shows how powerful the potential behind this kind of code really is. This also brings us to the end of this episode of Let's Delve. So leave a like if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe and turn on notifications if you haven't already, and leave your thoughts on our Minesweeper clone in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.